Hey everybody, welcome to The Same Drugs with Megan Murphy. I'm Megan Murphy. Today on the show, I'm super stoked to be talking with award-winning journalist Nancy Jo Sales. Um, she is the author of American Girls, Social Media and the Secret Lives of Teenagers, and her documentary, Swiped, Hooking Up in the Digital Age, came out in 2018. I reached Nancy Jo from her COVID hideout, her secret COVID hideout. She's escaped New York for a little while. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Can you hear me? Yeah, you sound great. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me about this. I really appreciate it. I'm happy to talk to you. I love your work. I think you're so smart and eloquent and brave because you say things that, you know, get you a lot of flack, but are brave to say in this climate. So I, I, you know, of, of policing speech and everything. So I'm happy to talk to you. Awesome. Thank you. (laughs) It's not always easy, but (laughs) it's worth it. I think, um, I've been obsessed with kind of the whole, the whole trend of dating apps, but also, you know, the impact of dating apps on, on relationships, on the way we date, on the way we have sex, and also on our brains. Like, I kind of think the whole thing is unhealthy in a myriad of ways, but I, you know, almost everyone I know uses them, um, when they're single, at least. And I know people who've met their partners on dating apps and every time I've been single, I get a lot of pressure from people to use them and I don't want to, like, I, I just, I don't like the whole idea of it. I don't, it's not how I want to spend my time. It's not how I like to meet people. And a a couple of times I've thought, okay, I'll just try it because people keep telling me it's so fun and great. Or they all, they're like, it'll be good for your ego. I'm like, I don't care. My ego is fine. Thank you. But <laughs> uh, it's the opposite. I mean, many studies say that it's quite the opposite of good for your ego. It, it, um, takes a hit on self-esteem and can cause anxiety and depression actually. So yeah. that's kind of a, a misconception. You know, they say ego boost. That's the phrase you hear a lot. It's an ego boost. Cause you get so many matches, but what that really translates into in terms of actual feelings of well-being is is different. Like the dopamine rush that you get from seeing a match and that match screen, you know, which is very carefully designed um, like a slot machine is as a momentary high. That's the ego boost. But then with a high, you get a dip. Mm. You know, and that's how the cycle of addiction starts. But anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, well, no, exactly. When I started looking into it, I started reading about how these dating apps functioned in the same way slot machines did and that it was the same kind of psychological thing going on there. And um, I mean, I guess, yeah, like, so I've tried them out and every time I do, it it just kind of gives me this like sick, empty feeling. Like it makes me feel much less hopeful about dating options because I'm like, I don't want to date any of these people. (laughs) And then I just, yeah, yeah, I don't like the whole process. I find it really kind of inhumane. And I mean, I guess I would feel the same way if I went and spent two hours at a slot machine. I feel like I'm throwing away hours of my life. Okay, well, um, so slot machine. So let's talk about that first since Mm -hmm. you raised that as uh, an issue. I don't know if you've seen my film Swiped. I mm-hmm. made a documentary film for HBO called Swipe, talking up in the digital age. And it's on all the HBO platforms still, but also you can see it on Amazon. You have the usual rental fee. I don't get anything for that, but I don't get any proceeds for that. But the rental fee is like a few bucks and it's on Amazon. So it's Swipe, talking up in the digital age. So what, what one of the big uh, segments in it is that when I spoke to Jonathan Bedeen, who is the COO of Tinder and one of the co-founders, he spoke pretty frankly and for the first time and and with a certain amount of pride, I would say, about how they had designed Tinder 
to be like a slot machine based on these principles first, you know, sort of formulated by the controversial um, sociologist B.F. Skinner. You know who that is. He's kind of a mad scientist type who's very controversial because he did he he didn't believe in free will. You know, he, he's a behavioral psychologist and sociologist, and he believed that you can program people to do stuff. And he showed that you can program pigeons to peck for food in certain intervals and that they were more likely to peck for the food when they didn't know when they were going to get the food than when they did know. So that's basically swiping, right? Like you get addicted, like he turned pigeons into gamblers was how he put it, Mm B.F. Skinner. And so you get addicted to dating apps in just the same way. You don't know when you're going to get the match. The algorithms are designed that way on purpose so that when you're swiping along, you know, suddenly it's like, ba-ding, you get the match, and you get the dopamine rush. And and Jonathan Medine in, in my film, he talks about it. Yeah, he's like, yeah, and you get that rush, you know. So the, all of this is no accident. You know, it's all this. Um, it's a corporate. It's a cor- it's a corporate invasion of the dating space, which a lot of people, you know, when they see it through this romantic haze of the you got you've got mail kind of myth of online dating where, you know, you might find this kindred spirit and send each other Jane Austen poems and all this kind of stuff. But really, this is a, this is capitalism. It's, it's a corporate takeover of our most private of spaces, I think. And, um, they have insidiously and, and quite, you know, openly designed it to get us hooked. And, and that's why the feelings that you feel, not just you, but everyone who dates on dating apps, um, I mean, it's, it's very well established now through a lot of studies that people don't typically feel good by doing this activity. And yet it's because, because it's addictive and because it carries with it all of those um, feelings of shame and, and, and boredom and compulsivity, compulsiveness, and, you know, all this kind of stuff that goes along with addictive behavior, you know, and, um, yeah, so it's no accident that you feel that way. Now, you know, people are very, I mean, something that I found, I'm sort of like the Cassandra of dating apps writing or something. Mm -hmm. I'm one of the very few people who's, you know, consistently and vociferously talking about this in articles and in my film and so forth. And, and what I found is that while people will agree with you and, and you'll have these interviews about it where people are very open about the fact that it's not making them happy. And, and, and there's other really serious issues of rape culture that go into this too, that we can get into in a minute, but I'm just talking now just about general, how you feel, like what you're saying, how does this make me feel, makes people feel bad. And yet there's this intense resistance to bringing that into the narrative of dating apps. Now, what we've seen recently with the video dating that's happened since COVID-19 hit is that once again, I, 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 I watch this with fascination, that once again, this new movement and what's happening with online dating is met by media with great celebration. They were talking about video dating and, and dating apps right now. And people are in isolation as if, as if they're talking about like, like the U S army liberating Paris or something. It's just like, Oh, and the, the dating app companies are doing their best to keep us all connected. Well, there's so much evidence that these, these platforms rob us of connection. But there is this intense resistance among media and even among people who use dating apps and feel things to the contrary to insist that they are for our good. And I have a lot of ideas about why that is, but I'm going to let you talk now. 
<laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there's about a million things that I want to pick up on in terms of what you just said. One of which is that these dating apps don't connect us, that they rob us of connection. That's, you know, as you say, like, and it's funny because the way that people talk about dating apps, not just the companies themselves, but, you know, people out in the world using dating apps, I guess they, they repeat this narrative also that, you know, this is helping us connect with so many more people than we would otherwise. So it it has to be good. I mean, what could be wrong with expanding your options? So what do you, like, what have you learned in your research about the actual reality behind that narrative and, and, and that idea of connecting with people through dating apps? It's a really big question. And, and the first part of the answer, I'll, I'll be positive because if I'm aware of the positives, of course, and if you don't, admit that you know about them right up front, then people are just immediately dismiss what you're saying as if you're some kind of, you know, party pooper or something. And, and really it's, it's quite the opposite. I think that, um, I think that the, the, the problem is not criticizing them. I think the problem is, um, buying into this corporate, uh, propaganda, you know, and, and allowing yourself to be sort of ro- like, uh, I think the word is robbed of true connection. So the positives are, are these, um, for one thing, it's, it is true. And it's important to note that there are, um, communities, of, of people who are, find it harder to connect and dating apps have helped with with, with that problem, you know, in certain, a lot of places in America, there's, uh, it's, it's still not safe to be an out person. If you're gay or trans LGBTQ, you can't just walk into a bar and start talking to someone and and start trying to, you know, strike up a romantic conversation. It's could actually be dangerous or just, there's not an available number of venues for you to do so. Mm -hmm. So going back quite a way, uh, you know, and I would say back into the 90s, even online dating before, well before dating apps has served LGBTQ people. And that's good. Uh, uh, that's that's for the good. Although on the flip side of that, you know, if you watch my film, there are gay guys in my film who talk about how dating apps completely ruined gay nightlife, which um was a big part of gay culture and, and still is. But, you know, you go into a gay club now as one young guy says in my film and everybody's on a dating app, you know, and he says, I love the quote. He says, but we're already all at the dance, you know? So, but it's this addiction. It's this, um, making people shy to even talk to each other when you're across the room. A guy, a guy in my film says, you know, I'll see a cute guy in a bar, a gay bar, and I'll just like go on scruff and see if he's on there instead of just going over and talking to him. So this is, this is a a double edged sword too, but you know, for, people who are um, physically challenged and can't get out, you know, so these are all, these are all great things, right? And um, of course, there are people who have struck up relationships and even marriages. Now, when you get into the data about that, though, the number of I mean, I don't want to get into like a whole data discussion, because it's probably boring to get into the number crunching on a podcast. But um, First of all, there isn't a lot of data from dating apps about how many marriages and relationships. And that's really weird because don't you think that if it was going to, you know, promote their companies, they would be releasing it all over the place? Don't you think you would be seeing ads for Match that said we've had 67 percent of people on this platform get married or, you know, be in long term relationships? They don't say that data, which, you know, and then you ask them like I asked Tinder in my film, like, why, why don't you say how many? And they say, Oh, we can't get that data. You're a data company. Of course you can. So you have to suspect that it's not really that high. Now Pew Research Center says 39% of people who use dating apps that's self-reported again. So have gotten married or had, you know, committed relationships. They don't say, how many of that breaks down to marriages or committed relationships? They don't say how long those relationships are. 
So we don't really know. There's not a lot of data. But even if it is 39%, okay, well, that's way less than half. And that's way less than the success rate for marriage, which isn't even that high in this country. It's only like hovering around 50%, I think. So there's not a lot of evidence that they actually lead to relationships. And they're, you know, I don't think they're designed to because it's kind of like, why would you want people to stop using your platform if if the whole point of the thing is to use the platform? The whole point of any social media is use to keep you using. They want to keep you swiping. They want to keep you engaged with the platform itself, you know, more than other people. So that's, I think, one of the really scary things about it is that it's just more and more a way to get us to engage with devices and platforms and tech itself rather than with actual other people. You know, it's an illusion. And in fact, you know, there, there's, there's, um, there is, there are studies that say that people, a lot of people who use dating apps, I don't remember the exact percentage, but it's high, never even meet up with someone that mm. they meet on a dating app. They just swipe. They just, it's like an entertainment thing that they say is out of boredom where they're just swiping and scrolling and looking at profiles and, and, you know, um, maybe messaging but not actually ever meeting someone. See, I don't think the, I don't personally think after a lot of thinking about this, a lot of uh, writing and talking to people and heads of companies and stuff. I don't actually think you're talking about connection. Your, your question was about connection. Mm -hmm. I don't actually think that the point of dating apps is in fact to connect us with anything, but the app. That's what I think. Like the whole point of it, it, not expressed, but hidden point of it is to just get you to keep using it and that's that's what you're supposed to do you relate your relationship the relationship they want you to have is with the app yeah right this is yeah this is a something i've been wondering about too um because I, yeah i you know i know that this is a business so it makes sense to me that these companies would want you to be using the app and not getting off the app, i.e. getting into a relationship. So I think the whole thing is kind of a sham. So, I mean, it's interesting to hear you say that. And I've also heard, you know, one of the main complaints from people, especially women, it seems, and I don't know if this is just because I've talked to more women about it or if this is accurate, is that they complain that nobody ever wants to meet up, that, you know, you'll match and you'll chat and then... The person will just disappear when it comes around to actually doing something in well, purpose. Well, why should People you are... have to? You know, think about it. Why should you have to look at look at it for what it really is? You know, you are getting that dopamine rush that tells you that something good. Your brain registers something good happened. I got a match. I got a like. You know. Um, a lot of people talk about how when they have conversations on dating apps, they're just just deadly boring. And it's very, very hard to communicate this way on these platforms and through text and stuff. And video dating, I haven't studied as much or interviewed people about it as much uh, because it's really just exploded recently with COVID-19. But I've heard, you know, the women that I have talked to about it say that the guys will, I don't, I'm not trying to man bash, but I'm just reporting what I've been told. They will say like, so how's quarantine treating you? And, you know, I mean, there's not a whole lot to talk about yeah, right. at this point. What are you, you know, doing? And, Nothing. And <laughs> you can't really, it's, it's just so, okay. So you, your brain says, when you get the dopamine, your brain says, wow, good stuff's happening. So it doesn't motivate you to have to go out and seek any more good stuff. It's sort of like, there's been studies of, of boys who play video games and there's some discussion of how it makes them less ambitious. Like they don't have to get out of the basement. They don't have to leave their parents home because their brain is saying you are succeeding. Wow. You are getting all these high, you know, uh, scores and everything, you know, so you don't have to do anything. You're, you're doing great. You know, so it's kind of the same thing. Like you get all these matches. I, I've so many people have said to me, like, it's a brag or something. I have 900 matches or I have 1200 matches or I have 700. Well, to me, that's like, <laughs> but that, that doesn't mean anything actually. Like it, it's really a, a meaningless number because 
if the point of the dating app is to actually get you to meet somebody to, you know, have, find love with and true connection and conversation and, and fun and all that so, great stuff that's supposed to go along with dating, then, then you wouldn't need this score. You wouldn't need this number of these hu- literally sometimes hundreds of people who've just basically just swiped on your picture. So that's one thing. I just think it's, it's like, it doesn't behoove you to do anything. Also, the way the platforms are set up, people, and you know, I'm going to say this because it's my feeling, it's my opinion. I'm not, again, man bashing. I, I don't like to be accused of that because, you know, I'm straight. I love men. I, just, you know, I, I can't believe we even have to, um, uh, you know, sort of apologize for these things. But in dating, it's important to remember that misogyny doesn't like go away in dating. Like it's in there (laughs) and it's part of, it's part of the whole dating space. Right. And my kind of thesis about all this is that these platforms have, because they have been designed by these Silicon Valley bros, they're sort of set up to privilege them, especially white male ones. You know, there's a lot of racism on dating apps. There's a lot of transphobia on dating apps that's so under discussed and almost undiscussed. So, you know, we see that the, who gets the most matches white males. And, and it's, it's really, um, it's really part of the whole thing that once you get into what really goes on, it's like, send me nudes let's get off, let's jerk off together. And very often these things are suggested by men. Not always, not always, of course, but this is what I've heard. This is what the culture of dating apps seems to be that the kind of way things go is sort of driven by straight men in straight women, straight men conversations and nudes, nudes, nudes. They're always asking for nudes. That's a direct quote from someone who just messaged me today and something you know, going back hundreds of interviews I've done. So if you're getting your dopamine rush and then you're getting nudes that you can jerk off to, and I'm saying this is from the male, straight male guy perspective, and then maybe you're getting, you know, hot chat with someone who's sexy and you can like masturbate together. What do you need to go out and, and, uh, and also you can be doing this with several women at the same time. What do you need to go out and spend money and go to get your pants on and go to a bar? You don't need to do that. You can not be watching TV while you're doing all this at the same time, too. You can be nicely on your couch, you know, really comfy. Have several, you know, guys will even call it their harem, you know. Mm-hmm. And and uh, what about this makes you need to make an appearance and, you know, have a good conversation, be smart, be funny, impress somebody. It's, it's kind of, um, and I'm not saying this is, you know, I'm giving you the, I'm, I'm describing it in a sort of, you know, like the worst of it, of course, you know, and I, and again, you know, you don't want to be accused of like, oh, but it's not all like that. My friend met the greatest guy and they waltzed off into the sunset together and he's just the best dad and all this stuff. Of course that happens. That's fantastic. I'm so happy for those people. And love is beautiful no matter where you find it. But let's that narrative, and it's not most people, as described, it's not most people that are finding that on dating apps. Most people are are feeling lonelier, less connected, depressed, anxious. And, I mean, this is, you know, the other area where you have to go and nobody goes, are, are getting raped or sexually assaulted. Or, you know, when people do meet up, there's an awful lot of sexual assault and rape and um, unpleasant experiences that just aren't talked about enough. And I've tried to talk about them. There was a ProPublica report in December of 2019 where I was so happy that someone is, you know, finally doing this. They did a survey of thousands of women and and 30 percent. This is just this astronomical number, way higher than off dating apps. 30% of women are reporting sexual, being sexually assaulted in some form on a dating app date. So, you know, 
these are the things that I think need to be discussed about these companies, about these platforms, and and just are it's it's been frustrating to me, frankly, after years of you know writing about this and making a film about it and everything. And like I said, the ProPublica was in 2019 December, so. And it, it led to a congressional investigation, actually, of not of not of rape, but of of predators being allowed to be on dating apps of, of um, sexual offenders. Excuse me. So it just it's like in December, it was just starting to go beyond, you know, my Cassandra wailing. <laughs> and then like COVID hit and like everyone's like, oh, video dating. It's great. This <laughs> is what the kids are doing. You know, it's just like Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. And, you know, like they're playing their guitars for each other and, you know, all this crap. And I'm like, oh, God, you know, so. So so would you say that do you think that these apps are then set up to benefit men and not women? Or do you just think they benefit nobody? Obviously, they benefit some people, but, you know, I I think ultimately (laughs) they well, you know, that's a really good question because. I, you know, bias in design is something that affects all, you know, it, it affects all things that are made, right? Like, um, look at bicycle seats. Like, what woman is, is comfortable sitting on those things? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, um, I, I think that the problem of bias and design does not uh, is, is, is even more of a problem in a way when you go into dating, when companies take over dating and design platforms based on, you know, what serves them as the guys who create them, you know, because look, look, just look at the swipe. I mean, the swipe is the most obvious example of all. Just look at the swipe. What is the swipe? It's pushing on someone's face, deciding hot or not, hot or not, hot or not. It's something that goes back to the hot or not uh, platform that was um, put out in 2000. It's just hot or not. It's hot or not for dating, right? And if you go back to early interviews with those guys, they're, I mean, they've learned the early founders of like Tinder and stuff and the other, they've learned to be much more corporate and much more measured and how they talk and interviews and everything but early on when they were just like 25 year old bros they were just out there and you can look back and see what they said you know and there were people interviewed around them who said like yeah they just wanted to get laid and then they started having um like model parties and inviting them to uh, their model parties in LA like oh let's get you all on tinder and you know whatever so I'm saying like these are these are the people who design these things. So of course they're they're objective. You know, you can say, well, women swipe on men too. But I mean, come on, we all know that objectification is more of a problem for for women in our society than for men. I mean, we are objectified more than men. That's a given. So when you have a swiping, when you turn dating into swiping on a picture, it's it, it obviously privileges men and the male gaze. I mean, I don't think it's, you know, you don't have to be a feminist scholar like you are to see that, right? So I think it's pretty obvious. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the biggest problems about it is that it's objectifying and it's, you know, there's this great um, feminist uh, dating historian named Zoe Strimple. She's British and she's in my film and she says, she has this great quote and she says something like, You know, if there's an opportunity to turn women into just bodies or body parts, that that opportunity will be taken. And this is what this is what dating apps sort of are, I think. Right. And it's it's not the same when you swipe on men. And even like when you break down the pictures and look at what men pose versus women. And, you know, we can't kind of of course, not every single woman is I'm not saying this at all. Not every single woman straight or or, or um, gay or whatever is on there, like, in some provocative pose. Of course not. But this is what the platform seems to demand of women. And it seems to be when you have a split second in which to make a, a, a determination. And it's a male gaze looking at you if you're straight. It's, it, when you know they have a split second to make a determination as to whether or not they want to swipe 
right or left because that's how it's set up. It's just more likely that you will be showing some part of your body that's going to catch the male gaze. Mm. And that is what, that's what you see. And it, it's, it's, um, it's very heteronormative, I think, based. And it's unfortunate because there's so much more to, to women than that. Now, the thing that Tinder likes to say, this is what they all say, well, it's no different if you just walked into a bar. Well, yes, it is. It is quite different than if you walked into a bar. It's, it's completely different. You know why? Because they have algorithms. And the algorithms run around, run around in their lightning speed way. And they find out how often you are swiped on. And if you are swiped on uh, right, if you're swiped on a lot to the right, then you go up in the stack. And if you're swiped not as often to the right, you go down in the stack. You literally become a bottom feeder. Hmm. So what winds up, winds up happening is that Tinder doesn't like to talk about this. Dating apps don't like to talk about this. But is that people, you know, it kind of um, becomes a hierarchy of like, allegedly worse looking people and better looking people, you know, who are swiping on each other all the time. And also this is where the racism comes in. People get more pictures of people who are like more like them that they have swiped on more. So in other words, if you've swiped on a bunch of white guys, you'll get a whole bunch more white guys, you know, it's just like Amazon or something. They're like, Oh, you like those shoes? How about these shoes? Those are kind of like those or Zappos, you know, and so the the kind of already built in racism in our society that people bring to these dating apps are not helped by it at all. In fact, it's an it's enforced, you know, you might not necessarily have that experience in a bar in a real like place where you meet people face to face. You might start talking to someone you never would have thought you would and and be like, yeah, uh, I, you know, you'd be might be surprised that you like that you like your interaction with this person. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's and anybody I feel like anybody who's met somebody in a bar and dated them would understand how different that plays out like how you know there's so many subtleties in terms of who you're attracted to and why that you don't have access to over a screen you know there's all sorts of other factors that you're missing I mean body language um and just like a vibe you know like how a person smells like things like that and I'm sure there's plenty of of my ex-boyfriends or whatever who if I'd seen them on a dating app, I wouldn't have thought, oh yeah, this is the guy that I'm into. You know, it it was about getting to know them in person and feeling into them because of our interactions, you know, next to one another. Smell even Mm -hmm. like we're not, we're not even aware how, how much we are affected by the way people smell, by the way they move their head, that they do this or that, you know, all of these things, um, we have evolved to pick up on each other, whether you can trust somebody. And this is another thing that really, um, you know, concerns me a lot when I think about the rape culture of dating apps is that, you know, women um, have to be on their guard in in any sort of dating situation about whether or not they can trust someone. They have to pick up on cues. You know, you can't do that. You cannot do that when it's just a picture and a text. And so we've evolved over tens of thousands of years to, communicate face to face it's a it's a off repeated statistic that is true that 7% of our communication is verbal and most of it is everything you just described and uh getting to know someone is um a very complicated thing now what i think is sad You know, and I don't mean to sound like the old boomer lady. You know, I I get accused of that, too. It's just it's just absolutely not the case. I'm a funky as, as, you know, I'm as funky as fuck chick who lives in the East Village. And I've had sex with like every kind of guy (laughs) over 40 years of dating. (laughs) I mean, I like, 
it's so funny to me when when there's this resistance and they say, well, you're just this old lady in your 50s. What do you know? Well, a lot because I am old. Like, that's what's great about being old is you get to know more <laughs> and and uh, you actually have some perspective on stuff and you do remember how things used to be. And I'm not looking back at things with rose colored glasses. I was raped as a teenager. I've had terrible experiences, just terrible way before dating apps ever existed. So I know that things weren't perfect and, and Oh, the bad, you know, technology came along and ruined everything. But I do think it's made some things that were already very, uh, seriously wrong with our culture worse. I really do. And I think that they have not made things better. And um, one of those things is not just, you know, how you might get to know someone or how you might, you know, feel if you can trust them. But also what I think is sad and, the, you know, I did that long preamble to see because I know saying something sad sounds like you're an old lady who just misses the past. But it is sad to me that young people now don't have serendipity and, 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 um, um, adventures, you know, like the, the wild thing about dating as it used to be was that any, you felt like anything could happen when you were a young thing running around, like stuff would just happen and you'd meet this person and you'd be like, Oh my God, Mm -hmm. wow. You know, that's why it's sometimes called magic because it feels like, it just like the universe just conspired to put the two of you together and it was fun and you would dance and all kinds of crazy things would go on. At least they did for me, mm-hmm. but you know, and that was what was great about it. You know, when you weren't being raped or sexually assaulted or, <laughs> or, or groped cause all that stuff happened too. And it was just awful and I'm not trying to trigger anybody, but it was awful It was awful and it's still awful, but there was some fun to it. Now, what I don't like about all this is like, it's all the same. It's exactly the same. It's conformity. You swipe, you meet, you drink, you fuck. It's like the same thing, mm-hmm. you know, every single time. Um, you have these same conversations over and over. Some people even copy paste things, mm-hmm. text things. Guys especially have told me they're copy pasting the same things at the same time. And young women have told me like, I saw he said the same thing to that person on Twitter that he said to me on the app last night or whatever. You know, it's just like it, it, this kind of turning dating into this sort of consumerism makes everybody like an object and you're just sort of like doing the same thing with the same object over and over and over again. And you're not ever challenged to sort of go outside your zone of just feeling like, wow, what's going to happen if I go to that bar? What's going to happen if I go to that party? Or, or, you know, people used to meet in the workplace too, which that wasn't frowned upon at all. That was just what we did. Now that has all kinds of things that are, that are really uh, dangerous about it. Because if you, you can get into power, power things that aren't right and where people can get, you know, people can get abused and and manipulated and power power dynamics can get really messed up but on the other hand there was something kind of fun about that too like going out for drinks after work and having that person that you just can't wait to see the next morning and you know there's all kinds of stuff that i think is lost when Mm -hmm. everybody oh and also you know i hear from so many people like I wanted to talk to her. These are good guys. Like I wanted to talk to her so bad. I was like working out next to her in the gym. I just wanted to talk to her so bad. I just couldn't do it. Or I sat next to this guy in the Starbucks or whatever for hours. And I just was waiting for him to talk to me and he never did it. And I never did it because the social anxiety that has arisen from always being able to just go on your phone has made people reluctant to actually strike up a conversation in person and, and meet yeah, and I wonder if people just think that's weird now. I mean, it's funny because I get the same the same kind of thing as you do when I've talked critically about dating apps. I'm 40, but, you know, I've, I've experienced, I've dated 
lots. Like I, you know, like I've had lots of long-term relationships. I've hooked up with people, you know, I've been out there in the world and experienced all these things. I've also like checked out the dating apps or whatever. But when you say stuff like this, you are like accused of just being out of it. Like, it's like, oh, this is just how it is now. Like you don't get it. Like you're old school, you're and prude, assume... you're old fashioned. And it's like, I'm really not a prude at all. <laughs> yeah, me, I but... know. I like, I get that too. And it's really the ageism that is accepted right now is, is really so offensive. And it's really also, it's really also sexism, you mm-hmm. know, it's usually, cause it's usually directed at older women yeah, you don't hear, younger... people don't say that to men, I don't think. I mean, I think women are probably more critical of these dating apps because they don't serve them in any way, I don't think. But I, I think you're right that, you know, men, I mean, in general, men just aren't dismissed as much as women are as they get older anyway. Right. And I mean, I went through a period a few years ago. I'm in my mid-50s now when I was about turning 50. I went through this period where um, when dating apps first came out, when I was like starting to be interested in them, it was before I was writing anything about them actually. Um, But I started to go on them before anyone I knew who was my age. Like back then it was considered among people my age, very creepy. Now, I mean like, oh my God, like my friends in their forties, fifties, sixties, you have people in their seventies in like, uh, retirement communities on dating apps and like really being really sexual <laughs> and stuff. So like, this is not the purview of, of young people anymore. I don't know. I don't know what it is about, um, people now that they want to just deny the sexuality of their elders. Maybe they always did. I don't know. Maybe it's some kind of, uh, taboo thing because they think of their they don't want to think about their parents having sex I don't know what it is but like older people have sex you know we still have sex and um so I was going on these dating apps you know around the time I first started to get interested in in tech and writing about tech actually which I really hadn't done before so I was on tinder like really when it first came out I heard about it like Maybe the month it came out or like a month later. And I heard about it from a 13-year-old girl. And she was telling me that she had gone on this app called Tinder. um, And she wanted to lose her virginity. She's 13. Okay. Because I was writing about girls and tech, which eventually became a book. Girls and social media. Um, Eventually became this book I wrote called American Girls, Social Media and the Secret Lives of Teenagers. But I was just, just very first reporting it in 2013 because... I, all these things were happening with girls. They were like getting, oh God, it was when it, 2012 was a really bad year for this kind of thing. Yeah. There was Amanda Todd who, you know, killed yeah. herself so tragically after she, a uh, Canadian girl, got her nude shared online. I was getting really worried about this. It was really disturbing me. So I, I was thought, you know, I want to find out what's going on. So I go out to LA I'm interviewing these girls in a mall there called The Grove. And this 13-year-old girl, I think she was 13. Oh, no, I'm, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. I heard about it first from 13-year-old girls. But this 16-year-old girl, she was 16, was the one who was telling me. I apologize. I made a mistake. She was the 16-year-old girl was the one who told me she wanted to lose her virginity. And so she described this thing where she, this guy had hurt her, this guy she'd been talking to online had really hurt her feelings because that thing where he's copy pasting and she found out he was talking to all these other girls at the same time. So she's like, I'm just going to go on Tinder and use, lose my virginity. And I was like, what's Tinder? So she takes out her phone and she shows me this thing. I'll never forget. I will never forget sitting there and just being like, uh, Oh, this looks, mm -mm. this looks like something that's going to change everything. And so she told me she went and met up with this guy and like, you know, he wanted her to get in, he was 16 also, but wanted her in, her to get in his car. And she said, no, I don't want to get in the car. And so then the, this is 2013 is when I'm having this conversation. It, it, Tinder came out December, 2012. This is like April of 2013. And so she says they went into the mall and they, <laughs> they made out on a pottery barn couch. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god, okay. So this is crazy, and this is going to change everything. This is just insane. And um, then you know, so it just seemed something like something. Oh, and to this day, you know, 
there are people who are scoping out young girls on these dating apps. It's really terrible. You know, this, this is what you get accused of. Oh, well, you're not being sex positive. I'm sorry. I, you know, 13, 14 year old girls should not be going on Tinder, Mm -hmm. but, and talking to men, but they do, they make fake profiles because our, our society sexualizes girls so early. And also they're curious, they're young, they want to see what's out there. And so they, you know, the early days of AOL chat, all, you know, everybody was talking to older guys, to see what it would be like, you know, can I handle it? Well, that leads to a lot of predation Mm -hmm. and, um, Tinder is, all these dating apps are are finally, again, finally, after years of criticism from people like me, are, they're finally being investigated for that too, that they have predators on these things. Of course, if you were a predator, not you, but I mean, you know, what, where would you go? Mm -hmm. Uh, the place where everybody's going to find sex and there's like underage girls on there, 18 and younger even because they're doing fake profiles. Anyway, so I'm writing about all this. I'm really concerned about it. I think it's really a very serious thing. But then part of me is like, hmm, I wonder what would happen if I went on there. <laughs> so I go on, and I was 49, I think. Now, at that point, Tinder didn't even go past 40. <laughs> it, said, it said like 18 to 40. So, like, it didn't even have, like, 40 plus or 50 plus at that point. Like, you couldn't even be on there if you were past. But I was like, well, let me see what happens. So I go on there, and I don't, like, uh, you know, I didn't really know how to use it right. This is probably, this is 2013 or 14, 2013. I didn't really know how to use it. So I just go on there. I put a picture on there. It's from my Facebook. So it says I'm 49, you know, immediately. I am not kidding you. Immediately. I get like a million hits from like 22 year olds <laughs> because at that point, I mean, I'm a little worse for wear at this point. This is like seven years ago, but 49, hmm, I was still looking pretty good. And, you know, I was still holding up pretty well. And so I didn't really realize it at the time. This was before I became aware also of all of this uh, MILF porn and all that stuff. Like I, I wasn't really... I know about all that stuff now and I've, I've studied like I got really concerned about like how porn is affecting young guys. But this is part how I learned about it because they start, you know, I don't, I don't want to get into like too graphic or TMI or anything, but they start coming on to you with what I was able to later identify as like a MILF porn influenced uh, mindset, <laughs> if you will. And I was like, this is crazy. This is just the the whole thing was just so, just so crazy. I mean, I find that uh, like in general, this is sort of off topic, but I find in general, men don't care about age. Like the kinds of guys who hit on, like guys in their 20s hit on me all the time and they seem to not have any idea how old I am. And when I tell them, like, because I can tell that I'm like, how old are you? Like 25? And I'm like, do you know how old I am? And they're like, I don't know, 30 something. I'm like, no, like 40. And they're like, eh, that's fine. <laughs> No, they want the MILF, they want the, like, Lisa Ann, you know who she is, right? They, no, they have, like, they grow so. up on Lisa Ann, she's the big, I don't mean big, but, you know, uh, famous porn actress, this okay. is a huge star, she's one of the top hits on all Pornhub, for year, going back years. Okay. And the MILF porn thing was actually pushed, I read about it in my book, American Girls, why is suddenly MILF porn, why is that a thing? It was pushed by this one company because that was their niche. That's how they got into the market. And they pushed it. And put, I think it was Brazzers. I'm not sure mm. at this point. It's been a few years since I wrote about it. But I think it was Brazzers. And they they pushed and pushed and pushed it. And, and she became this big star. And, um, yeah, like all of this stuff has an effect. I went on a few dates. One of them, I was like, I've got to see some ID. Because I'm not getting arrested. (laughs) And he was over 18, but he was 19. And he lied to me. Like, he had a fake profile saying he was, like, 25. And I was like, dude, you're 19. Like, Uh no. And, like, he said, can't we just go to your house? And I said, no, my daughter's there with the babysitter. And he's like, don't you have a stairwell? And I was like, this isn't the dorm. 
Also, you know, that's like, not fun for me. Like, I don't want a fucking nineteen year old in a stairwell. <laughs> I know. This should just not be happening. This is like unnatural. You know, it's just like this should not be happening. So I just yeah, I don't have I don't have a lot of good memories for of my dating updates, but I did go on it. See, that's the thing is when guys People, I, recently, I oh, I just did this thing for the Guardian on what we were talking about before, you know, video dating and how, you, you know, like how how the press, the media is saying, oh, it's just so romantic. And then I'm getting all these young women who I talk to and sources and stuff saying they're all saying they want to quarantine and chill and they're still looking for nudes and the same shit. It's just like, yeah, it's just COVID. And now it's like we could die. And so. I wrote this thing in the Guardian and I got this, you know, angry message on Instagram from this young man. He said, you're just so old. You just don't know anything that's going on. And I suggest I can't believe that I'm having to tell a, re- a reporter twice my age how to do her job. But what you should really do is just go on Tinder and see what it's like and see how those women on there are doing the same thing. Well, and I was like, uh, <laughs> well, first of all, he has no idea. Like if I've ever been on Tinder, I have. But I said, so I said to him, okay, um, I'm open. You know, I, I talked to women for this piece. That was an opinion piece in the guardian, the opinion of women and of me, but I'm open to hearing what you have to say. Why don't you do what all these women did? Send me some screenshots. I won't use names or usernames. Send me some screenshots of, of women doing the same thing and quote unquote, and you know, go ahead. I will show me, show me what you're talking about. So he's, hems and haws and back and forth in these dms i'm like what's really going on here i said you're not getting any matches are you (laughs) and he's like no and then he starts asking me for advice like i'm his mother how do you think i can get more like why don't you think these women are like responding to me and stuff and then it becomes this like you know counseling session about his approach and i said well you're not going to like get women to to want to talk to you if you're if your come on is like, you know, you're stupid like you did to me. So, yeah, I have a long history of this. I wonder why <laughs> you think, because I've noticed this also, why do you think people get so defensive about dating apps? Like when you criticize it, people get really defensive and they get so angry defensive. at you. Yeah. Defensive, angry at me, want to call, like, call me names. And yeah, it's really weird. I think there's a lot of different reasons. Mostly men. It's mostly men, but sometimes women too. Or the women just stay silent. Like they don't, it's like, "Mm, I agree with you, but I don't want to say that. Uh Uh-huh. You know, I think it's, there's a lot of reasons. Um, I think one thing is like, we want to believe in love. Love is, is so important. And it's like, people need love. They need hope. They need connection. They want to believe in this fantasy because it seems so wonderful that you can just push a button and you'll find love. I mean, it's like it seems like magic. Like, who doesn't want to believe in that? And I think they think that you're okay. Then there's the whole thing of the shaming thing. Like, you're not sex positive. There's such pressure to be sex positive. But I see I think all of this. I think that's a kind of such a misunderstanding of what's really going on, because I think that all of what's going on is not sex positive. I don't think hookup sex on dating apps, which I've done and I've had, is is very sexy. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I mean, at least not the first time or two or three. Like, how could it be? You don't know this person. You met in this very awkward way. Um, it's hookup sex, It's which is, you know, generally many studies say is less enjoyable for women. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just not very intimate. And I think that the whole way that – this dating app culture is there's so many choices and there's so such a high high chance of being ghosted rejected treated like shit that everybody shuts down their emotions and their feelings and so when you get in the bedroom it's not hot it seems like it seems as controlled and as as um it seems as controlled and sterile as the app itself you know, it's just like, it's not wild unless you're very, very drunk. And there's a lot, a lot of alcohol that goes into this too sometimes because that's how people, 
you know, break down their inhibitions of the whole weirdness of the whole thing. It's weird. The whole thing is just weird. And, and so there's, um, you, you get super drunk and like that can lead to either kind of good or kind of bad, but also dangerous condoms don't get used. People get slapped around. I've heard of so many terrible stories. People get raped and, uh, there's just I, I, I have a somebody I have a, you don't know, right? Like that's yeah. weird. It's weird. like I've had I've had hookup sex before for sure, but I feel like it was almost always, if not always, with somebody that was like a friend of a friend, like somebody that I kind of knew a bit. It wasn't just some complete random stranger that, you know, I met online and then went and met up with in person. It just seems sketchy, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I, um, I'm a single mom, so I, you know, had a baby on my own in 2000 and this online dating stuff goes back to then. And even before the first online dating site was match and it came out in, I believe 1997. Now I wasn't, 97 or 95 it's it's mid to uh third quarter 90s i i don't remember exactly 95 or 97 right but like then i didn't need it because like i said it was the 90s in new york were extremely fun you know it's it was just i mean uh it, I had a lot of fun <laughs> back then. And then so then I got pregnant and had this baby. And then I'm like, oh, damn, how am I ever going to go on a date again or have mm. sex? What am I going to do? So I thought, okay, well, I'll go on this match. I'll see what this match is like and everything. And, you know, straight people and straight culture don't like to admit it because they like to put it on the gays and say that gay culture was all, you know, always you know hook up sex and everything but that's just bullshit because people were doing the exact same thing with match match has this idea in the early 2000s there were guys just wanted to just come over and hook up mm -hmm. same thing it was harder to get to that point because it wasn't on your phone and in your hand and you had to like exchange more messages and there was more writing involved and i remember there was a lot more writing like because there was this whole you've got mail bullshit and you you had to pretend like you were getting to know each other There's a lot of words mm -hmm. but once you know once it became a thing and you were like in the same room it was the same thing it was it was maybe not as quick and as instant and as much and as many, but the same thing was happening. And I remember being so um, I wouldn't say shocked because not a lot shocks me, but like disgruntled about that. Like, wow, this doesn't seem good. <laughs> like, you mm -hmm. know, that we're not like, like people aren't really making an effort to get to know you at all, you know. I mean, I do think that, that technology has slowly but surely, and this it didn't start with dating apps, it started in the 90s with like, like I said, with like Match and AOL Chat. Oh, after Match, there was, then there was um, eHarmony, which, you know, really weird. Like they didn't allow gay dating at first until they were sued, I think. And then there was OkCupid, okay which was still on the computer. But I think like slowly but surely, it, over time, in a very short amount of time, technology chip, 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 chipped away at intimacy. Yeah, totally. At emotional intimacy. Yeah. What do you What do you think um, the impact of dating apps has been on relationships? So not necessarily the dating or the hooking up part, but actual relationships. You know, I hear often. Um, and, you know, have been in, in this situation before too, you know, uh, but, you know, women you see online talking about this a lot where it's like their boyfriends on Tinder or whatever. Um, I wonder, I wonder if that choice thing factors in where you're sort of like, you're given this thing that says, look at all these choices, look at all these people out there. Like you could be with this person instead, I mean, they're not nagging you or trying to hold you accountable. <laughs> like, maybe this is better. Like, do you, has, do you think there has been an impact on relationships? Absolutely. That's such a good question. And it's the thing that nobody talks about is how it's not just, you know, 
the people who want to say this is all really great because it's just so sex positive and you just get to fuck whoever you want and that's just a wonderful thing and how can that be bad because it's freedom but you know at some point you might want to or you you will want to be close to someone and there's nothing wrong with that that's like it doesn't have to be the goal i'm not saying we all need to be you know leave it to beaver family which was always a lie in the first place or you know or even get married i mean i'm not married i've been married twice i hate being married but at some point you really you really really might want to be close to someone Mm -hmm. and and be able to feel like you can trust them and be intimate with someone emotionally and i do think that this dating fomo this always someone better always someone you know scratching at your ear is complete has completely upended the ability to have commitment and trust and i think that anybody who's honest about it would say that it's just kind of obvious come on you know because relationships are hard they're not always fun you know sometimes they're great and everything's going great but um can you imagine what's going on in all these households right now with uh, i mean with with people being stuck Mm -hmm. in the house in covid19 and 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 like uh, having to do housework together and do schoolwork for the kids and, and just be together all the time. And this, and that, you know, it's just like, that's hard. That's yeah. a hard thing to be doing with each other. And I actually have written uh, a piece for Vanity Fair about, I, you know, now the New York Times is doing this stuff, but weeks and weeks ago I did about how a lot of the burden of all this work is falling on women because mm-hmm. statistically they do more. So these, we go through hard times together, right? Sometimes, sex is good sometimes it's bad sometimes you know um things are hard at work whatever so in those highs and lows of relationships and when the dips happen well now everybody's got their little apps yeah and not, not just apps but instagram and twitter and dms and all of these other ways that people can contact each other you can be sitting in bed next to your partner and they can be on Facebook talking to their high school crush. You know, it's really just destroyed, destroyed trust. I have a friend who was one of the ladies in the whole Tigerwood scandal. Mm -hmm. And um, I forget what year that was. It was probably, is that 10 years ago or more even? Well, anyway, I was thinking 2008, but I'm not talking. She said, she said, that she told me this she was lying in bed and he didn't have his um uh sounds turned off and they were somewhere you know he was married too at the time but he was i guess telling her that it was a sham marriage and it was just for publicity or whatever okay married men Mm -hmm. okay so she's lying in bed and she hears him going click 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 so he goes to the bathroom. She's like, who is he texting in the middle of the night? Is he texting his wife? So she picks up his phone and she sees, oh, my God, he's like sexting with like 10 women at oh once. God. And and it was such a huge scandal. And Oh, my God, Tiger, what have you done? Well, now that's called dating. Mm. Like, that's just dating. That's just sort of normal. To be having several things going at once, and it's completely changed expectations in relationships because for a lot of people, especially younger people, you're supposed to be okay with that. Like, oh, well, you're square. Like, you just want one person, or how can you tell someone what to do? And, I mean, everybody should have freedom, of course. I I mean, of course, again, you should have freedom to pursue whoever you want, whenever you want, but not if you're – like, what happens then – to trying to actually be with someone. And this is what, this is, this is what, you know, this is what has happened. Uh, I, I get, oh my God, I get people who want to complain about this kind of stuff. Well, you know, to, to someone like me who has a voice to talk about it. And I've been trying to talk about it. They, I get these, I got Twitter ever since the thing on the Guardian came out a couple of days ago. I'm getting all these Twitter DMs and Instagram DMs and stuff about women, mainly from women, complaining about um, behavior, you know, things that you, 
for some reason is uncool to talk about out in the open. Although women, young women will, will complain about it on Twitter sometimes. They do. Will say like, oh, these men, you know, like men are garbage. Hashtag men. No, men are trash. Mm. <laughs> men are garbage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hashtag men are trash. Mm-hmm. You know, because this, because this technology thing has just led to so much dysfunction in, in trying to pursue and maintain a real a real kind of relationship. And I'm not saying that, oh, all women want relationships and all men don't. It's not like that. Justin McLeod, who's the founder of Hinge, is interviewed in my film. And he has a really good quote in the film, actually. And I thought it was really, um, you know, I thought it was really kind of great of him to like sort of admit it and state it so plainly and he said look this technology has tipped the balance towards people who want just to hook up Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's not to say that all women just want a relationship and all men are want to hook up someone some things someone other things but if you are a person who just wants that the balance has tipped towards you in this new dating world well, yeah, which to me sort of means that the balance has tipped towards people who are kind of, I don't want to go around de- calling everybody sociopaths because it's not accurate. That's sort of how I describe them. But people who are sort of checked out, who have like attachment issues, who are superficial, maybe narcissistic, like it, it's because the kinds of people who who only want hookups are the kinds of people who don't want connection and they don't want accountability and they don't want trust. And, you know, they don't want to have to really bother getting to know somebody or worry about that person's feelings or anything like that. And I just think that's such a strange way to engage with the world. I mean, for me, I don't, it's not something I desire. It's not fulfilling. It's not sexually fulfilling. It's not fulfilling in any way, but I guess I, I sort of feel like, you know, people have been sold this fantasy of a relationship that's all just, you know, being in love and it's great and everything's great and easy. And if it starts to get hard or isn't so great, you drop it immediately and move on. And I think the dating app thing has tied into all of that, where it's like, oh, this person is being a bitch or whatever, like, and sorry to use a misogynist term, but, um, you know. Or or this person, exactly. Well, that's why another reason it circles back to, I don't mean to interrupt you, to, okay. to the whole thing of feminism, because, exactly, because it's so much harder to try and establish gender equality in a relationship if your partner, if he's a man, a straight man can just say, oh, fuck you, you're being a bitch, bye, I'll go get another one. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it's like, you know, any any complaint that you would have that might be valid about the way that he's behaving, like these husbands who are not pulling their weight in the COVID-19 situation or, um, you know, a boyfriend who, you know, you, you uh, object because he's being flaky like so often – I've heard men are the, and I've experienced men are these days not showing up on time, changing dates around, not being able to pin them down for anything. Mm -hmm. Like even, even like, you know, just like what used to be the social contract, there used to be a social contract. I tell, um, you know, and then you're being outrageous. Oh my God, what are you demanding of me? You're demanding that I actually keep a date or have a date. You know, it's like, the minimal thing, the thing that I hear over and over from young women is the bar is so low. Mm. It's so low. And I've had, you know, I've told young women, and again, I don't mean to sound like the, the old, you know, the wife of Bath or something, like the wise and old witch woman who knows it all. I'm not saying that I'm like that, but I can tell you there was a time when you could say to someone, okay, let's go on a date. We're going on a date on Friday, 8 o'clock at this restaurant. Great. See you then. Mm-hmm. And you would literally not have to talk about it ever again until eight o'clock. You would just show up <laughs> at that restaurant. That was the social contract. It was a date. You made a date and you do it. And you don't have to like text 50 friggin' times or change it. You're not really allowed to change it. And in fact, if you do change it, you're kind of an asshole and you might never speak to that person again, especially if they do it at the last minute, which is very, very common these days. Mm-hmm. Like you literally just show up because you said you would. 
okay? Because we are people who are responsible to each other and, you know, if we make a plan, we make a plan. And that's just the way it is. And I've told this to young women and they look at me like I'm talking about a place called Shangri-La where, where you know, people do what they say, they promise they will. Now, once you get there, it, how he acts might be terrible and you might not even find out that you like him. But here's the other thing that I think dating used to be that it's not anymore. Going on a date was not such a big deal. Like, I, why did going on a date, like actually promising the, the littlest thing to actually show up and spend time together, why did that become this big, heavy thing that was like, oh, my God, a date? Like, or is this a date? You know, it's it's no big fucking deal. It's really just dinner. And we used to just do it because it was fun. And it didn't mean anything except that we had dinner. That's mm-hmm. all it meant. Mm-hmm. You might like me. I might like you. We might have sex that night. We might have sex in three weeks. We might get married someday. We might never talk again. But really, it's just dinner, and we're just doing it because you're cute. I'm cute. It'll be fun. Let's see what happens. It was not – it was a much more, I feel like, lighthearted kind of thing. And we didn't know everything there was to know about the person because we didn't have Facebook and Instagram and everything. And we didn't – we hadn't seen, like, videos of them having – doing their grandma's birthday dinner in Nebraska a month ago. So we didn't like know every little last thing. There wasn't this whole sleuthing that goes on now, which women really have to do because a lot of these guys they're meeting now, they really don't know anything about them. So there's sleuthing. This young woman I spoke to said like, yeah, like basically any young woman today could immediately join the FBI because like Mm -hmm. in order to date, you have to be so good at using the internet to find out about someone. So um, it was more like it would be someone, yeah, like you knew from work or or um, or you knew from friends or you met at a dinner party or you met in a club or a bar. Or you had a conversation with them or whatever. Um, I mean, I had sex with somebody that I met in a deli once, <laughs> <laughs> but I think I was drunk. So like <laughs> stuff like that happened, too. Yeah. But, you know, and that that happened. Stuff like that happened, too. But, you know, that was part of being young and, you know, use condoms and be careful. But it just it wasn't like such a big deal. Like, I think that that for some reason men have gotten so like it's male. And I mean, I'm going to be on my feminist soapbox a little bit. Sorry. I think it's male entitlement. I think it's just male entitlement. Like, for some reason, men, young men especially, seem to think that like women just want them so bad totally and like want them so bad and want to date them so bad that every little thing every little text is like oh my god she's texting me she's obsessed she's obsessed with me she's gonna try to pressure me into marrying her (laughs) (laughs) right i have girls in my american girls book talking about this these these really funny um sophomores at the university of delaware these 19 year old girls these totally like hot wonderful smart girls were just ragging on guys and talking about how they were so bad in bed they couldn't get it up they also had erectile dysfunction these are these girls talking not me and they were just awful and yet they all assumed that you wanted to be them to be your boyfriend which Mm. none of them did you know so i don't know i don't know how this happened but it it used to be way way more light-hearted and fun (sighs) Well, yeah, and I think I think that kind of ties into the whole like dick pics thing because I do I think it's true I think men think that they're all like these stallions and women want them and they're like pleasing these women when in fact like especially when you're younger but it still happens when you're older too is that like they're so boring in bed and they're not good and their dicks can't get hard and blah 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 and like I'm they have they get... seem completely unaware of the fact that these women are like oh i'm not into this like and th- meanwhile they're something? thinking yeah 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 well i'm a t- if i can be a test case and i'll probably get if anyone cares to listen to a podcast of me on your show i don't know um, I'll probably get so reamed for this by men, but I don't care. I just have to tell you, as a test case, as a person who actually did have sex with men in the 1970s and 80s and 90s and 2000s and 2010s, 
I got to tell you, men are not straight men overall in my sample. One person are so much worse in bed than they used to be. Huh. Like they are just they ha- the like the, the the level of skill or whatever you want to call it is just gone down, plummeted overall. Yeah. I'm not saying every single one. I'm not saying every single one. And there are still men who are great in bed. And I've been very, very lucky that I've known both. But overall, in my sample, it has just plummeted. And I really think it has everything to do with the backlash against feminism, with tech, with dick pics, with all of these things, with seeing women more as objects, with not wanting to act like you care about someone, with hookup culture. With in porn. Which I mean, if you're learning about porn, sex from oh my porn, God, porn. Cro- oh, I'd like saw... you're not going to have any idea how to please a woman. <laughs> Porn has ruined men in bed. It yeah. really has. You know, one time I was in bed with this young man in my dating app period. And I said, I just want you to point to it. You don't have to touch it. Just just point to it. Do you even know where it is? And he's like, uh, isn't it inside? And I was like, inside what, though? Like, what, what <laughs> part of inside are you talking about? Like, he literally did not know. Like, do they not give them anatomy I don't know. Oh, no, nope. it's just like there's no. They don't even go near it, and some do. Okay, some do, but it's really, it's really uh, the oral attention thing. It was actually a thing in the seventies. Um, I was, you know, I I had sex for the first time in the late seventies, and I was just become like a teenager. And boys, that was a point of pride. Mm-hmm. Like they had to do it, you know. Like they had to do it. It was like a thing. Feminism was kind of sort of working before Ronald Reagan. And men were into it, too. I mean, like, it's like in my many of my past experience, like I've never I was never with a man who didn't just kind of do it voluntarily and was like into it. Now, boys, now. Oh, I I, I mean, no, I mean, I guess I'm thinking about. (sighs) Yeah, no, no, no. I think you're probably right. And I mean, I also I hear this. I don't know. Maybe I was just lucky with those guys, too. But I, I hear what you're saying from other women my age all the time. Like they complain about it all the time that they won't do it. Also, it's a problem of communication. It's like if you good sex is all about communication, right? Like mm-hmm. it doesn't necessarily have to be verbal. But it's things you do with your body or, you know, putting someone's hands here or there, or, you know, moving in such a way that yeah. you kind of suggest things or. Well, you know, that's you about getting to know and... somebody, right? right that's exactly. about the and intimacy like... and building trust and feeling comfortable with somebody. Exactly. And if you're just getting, you know, if you're just getting into bed with someone that you had like this awkward video chat with or text chat with or or too many drinks slammed at some bar where, you know, you just met for 45 minutes and yeah. it's just not going to be hot yeah. it's also overly determined too it's just so it's so it just feels like not not a mag- not the magical adventure like i was so sad i read a washington post article they love for some reason my media brothers and sisters I would like to know why you love online dating so much and also why you love to run articles about how millennials are not having sex. It seems to either <laughs> like um, it seems to please you or maybe please your 50 something male editors. I don't know, but they love to run these articles about how millennials are not having sex. Yeah, I do not believe this. I do not think it is studied properly. It is not true. Okay, because millennials and younger people are having all different kinds of sex. They are having FaceTime sex. They're having masturbation to porn. They're having mutual masturbation. They're having chatterbait. They're having getting off to text. And yes, they are having sex. At least in my experience, I've had sex with some millennials. They're they're still doing it. But anyway, the media loves to run these stories about how millennials are not having sex. And that's good. You know, I, I, I don't know why it's good. Isn't it bad? Like, shouldn't they be enjoying themselves? I don't get it. I really don't get this whole thing at all. Americans are so messed up about sex. But anyway, so I was reading this article in the Washington Post, and it was like, the millennials are not having sex. And this one person was interviewed, and I think it was a man. I'm not sure. It was a man or a woman. And said, it's, there's just nothing magical about it. 
And, you know, I believe that was a true quote because that's something I could almost hear one of the girls I've interviewed say. There's nothing magical about it. Because really, that's that's the problem. There is nothing magical about it when it's all overly determined by tech and dating yeah. apps and where you have these awkward, awkward, week-long sleuthing sessions where you find out all about this person and then meet them and you're like, ah, hello. And, you know, and nothing feels natural. Yeah. Nothing feels in the moment. Nothing feels magical. And so, uh, like, if it is true, if in fact it is true that millennials are having less sex, who can blame them? Like, who wants to have sex in this manner through, through you know, meeting someone on a screen yeah. and then, you know, having hookup sex where, you know, there's not even, you're not even allowed to act like you care about the person. Yeah, you're not supposed to, you're supposed to pretend like you don't care. You're supposed to play all these weird games and making a plan. You talked about this earlier. Just making a plan is seen as this like crazy form of pressure and you're trying to pin some down and stop trying to like, you know, force me to, you know, hold me down or whatever. Like, whereas that should just be completely normal. Like you said, you know, you, you make a plan, you do the plan. <laughs> <laughs> you go on a date, you get to know each other, whatever. Yeah. And can I just interject here? If there are millennials listening, this isn't about you. This isn't your fault. You, this, if this is, if this applies to any of you, or if you're feeling offended that an older person is saying these things and using the word millennial about your generation, I apologize if you feel that way, but it isn't about you. It's about corporations. This is really all, I'm sorry you know, about capitalism. Mm -hmm. This is about capitalism mm -hmm. taking over your chance for magic, for intimacy, for love. And that to me is the real villain is, is these companies who they're you talking about, talk about someone who doesn't care. Mm -hmm. The heads of these companies are the people who don't care. They don't even care that people are getting assaulted mm -hmm. or that they're being, you know, being, that their racial slurs or transphobic slurs on their on their sites. They don't even care. People report them. They do nothing. They don't kick them off the site. People rape people, and they get told that, and they don't even kick them off the site. They, they don't do not care, care that they're making people miserable. They don't care what this is doing to people's brains. I mean, social media use in general, right? There's all sorts of research on this, but also, of course, dating apps in particular. You know, what it's doing to people's mental health, what it's doing to their attention spans, what it's doing to their brain. Like, these are all really negative things. It's As you said, it's making people feel depressed and anxious. Sean Parker, who's one of the early, you know, executives of Facebook, of course, you know, now he's got his bajillions of dollars. So thanks a lot for coming out and finally saying this, which he did in, I think, 2017 or 2018. He's like, yeah, what we did there, you know, meaning Facebook, social media, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty bad. It's uh, kind of destroying the world. Uh, oh, who knows what it's doing to children's brains? And I was like, wow, thanks. Thanks for admitting it. It's a quote. You can look it up. I don't know the exact. I'm paraphrasing. But and several, several um, CEOs of these companies and big executives of Facebook in particular have come out, you know, after they're sitting in their like, you know, rich guy compound now with their armed guards because they're afraid the end of the world is coming, which they, you know, accelerated probably um, through all this, you know, <laughs> disruption of our democracy and so forth which they now realize but they're like yeah we did a bad thing huh you know like oh yeah yeah we did <laughs> and <laughs> and so but you know what and probably by now a lot of the people who listen to your podcast know this and you must know this but you can't have this this discussion without mentioning why it's section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996. That is the whole problem. That is the root of all evil. It is yes. this law that, in, that frees up these companies from any responsibility for anything third parties do on their sites. So if you go on a Tinder date and you get raped, it's not Tinder's fault. They can't be sued. If uh, somebody shoots your grandpa and puts a a video of him dying on Facebook, which is something that I actually that actually happened that I wrote about. 
It's not Facebook's fault. If it's up there for 20 minutes, your dead grandpa, like being menaced by his killer, Facebook can't be sued. So this is really the root of everything because they're just making their money, you know, hand over fist and they have no responsibility to their users whatsoever. And they cannot be sued. And this, this law has got to be changed. Yeah, I but know, it's I'm not because it's so a... many vested interests are, you know, because these companies give so much money to government. When I mean, I, and then this is the whole fight that happened around Backpage and then Craigslist with trafficking and things like that. And Twitter does the same thing. You know, Twitter takes no responsibility for, you know, there being um, predators or, you know, violent, misogynist, racist pornography on their platform for tra- trafficking. You know, not not our fault. Our hands are clean. That's their problem. It's all It's all this law that allows them to be completely unaccountable and to make so much money off of it. I'm really, I'm, I mean, even, even before COVID-19 hit, and especially now, I'm very concerned about what, where this is all going. I think it's only going to get worse because now that people can't actually, I mean, it's like, you know, hookup culture looked pretty bad. Now it looks even worse because, I mean, I guess having meaningless sex was better than like having none Mm. and i think it's gonna (laughs) i mean i don't know but it's it's like it's gonna i don't know what the answer is to that question actually that was with a question mark but i i do think it's gonna make these devices more and more privileged it's like a weird uh like acceleration exacerbation of everything that was wrong and everything that i feared from what I was researching and hearing from people was that more and more it was all, all of our interactions with each other in this sex and dating space was being mediated by screens. And this is just going to be more and more because we can't, people can't actually kiss. Like when I, when I read that, you know, the New York city department of health put out this warning that said, you know, probably the best way to spread this disease is to kiss somebody. Don't kiss people. And like my heart just dropped because I thought, wow, that's like, that's really the, one of the best things is, is about life is kissing mm-hmm. somebody yeah. that you like. And one of the best things about being young, and I just feel for people of all ages that this is no longer something we can do right now. And that, um, I mean, we will eventually, they'll find a vaccine eventually. It will, it will, it will, uh, it will get sorted out. But in the meantime, these companies are just, oh, they are shock doctrining the hell out of it. Let's add video capability to our dating apps. Let's give people these new features. Let's launch this new, like, COVID dating friendly site where we can all pretend like we're having, like, a dinner party date with 10 people, like a Zoom date. And, you know, they're just capitalizing, capitalizing, capitalizing because that's what they do. And uh, I'm just worried that what's going to happen after is that people will even be more dependent on all this stuff. Yeah. I'm I'm worried about it. Yeah, I've wondered that too because, you know, so you've looked at what's been happening with dating apps and COVID and and how that sort of, I, I, I mean, I guess, so are more people using dating apps now? Is that true? Like, yeah. because of... Oh, yeah, because the online dating, we do know this, you know, at least if you listen, I mean, I don't know, I think all these companies lie. But in this, in the, in this particular case, I would have to believe it because people are stuck at home, single people are stuck at home, they're lonely, horny, bored, dying for connection and comfort. Of course, dating, online dating has surged and the dating app companies are adding all these features as quickly as they can. Bumble already has video dating, as I understand it. And um, I haven't been on it lately, but I've read about it. And and all the other ones are rushing, rushing to put this on. It just cost them more money. So they were waiting as long as they could to do it. But now they pretty much have to, or they're going to lose it. But people just FaceTime. You know, they go from... The typical, even before COVID happened, the typical way that things go is people go from like swiping, matching, messaging, and then maybe FaceTiming. You know, people are doing a lot of FaceTiming and stuff if if they don't have video capability on the apps in question. So, and 
but video dating, <laughs> video dating is the new normal was a quote, was it was a headline, I think, from the New York Times. Video dating is the new normal. No, you are normalizing it with your headline. Hello. <laughs> That's what you are doing. Like, the, it's so weird to me how they so want this to be the thing that we do. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I'm, it's so weird. I, I, I know, to... I find it weird too. And I find it weird how so, so many people, like most, like the vast majority of media and it seems people in the world do want to just normalize it and pretend that it's just light and fun and sexy. Well, I, yes, case in point, the New York Times ran a piece, I think two days ago, about nude selfies are high art. You can just hear them. We're going to get this I forget who wrote it. It was a woman. I think she, we're going to get this professor of art and oh, oh, it's going to be so hip and cool and the kids will love it because it's nude selfies are high art. So they have this thing and they run this thing and it's all about, it's got like pictures of Titians and Moglianis and stuff. And like, like, do you fucking know really what happens in an interchange between two people? who are exchanging nudes, it's you like, huh, huh, can I see more of you? Huh, huh. You know, you have no idea what you are talking about if this is what you think is going on. Of course, there are young women are beautiful and they are taking pictures of themselves that look beautiful. I'm not denying that. That's not, that's not what's being, that's not what I'm arguing against. What I'm saying is like, no mention in this piece of the pressure to send nudes. Send nudes is the first line of my book, American <laughs> Girls, because I thought it was so outrageous and objectionable and offensive that a 13-year-old boy would say this to a 13-year-old girl mm-hmm. over text, that this was the new normal in dating. Send nudes, which he's saying to a million of, this was 2016 I wrote this. You know, it's like, then it was like news to people. Now it really shouldn't be news and it shouldn't be normalized because that is not what we want 13 year old girls to be having to think about because I said well, what did you think when he said that yeah you know and she said well I thought like what should I take and what kind of picture should I t-? you know it's just not come on this is not okay as they say and oh but the New York Times thinks it's just like art and you know oh and, oh and why is it all about women's bodies like where are the dick pics which every dick pic ever is ugly. I'm sorry. I know that girls. Just, uh, what what on earth? Who told men that any woman wanted a dick pic? You know, I think it's very different for gay men. And and I have a gay brother and I've had discussions with him and his husband and all their friends about it. And it, it, it is different. And I'm not going to try and comment on that because because I'm not saying like every, I say every dick pic is ugly and that's kind of wrong because maybe to some people it's not but to most women and this is borne out by studies they don't like to get unsolicited dick pics and 57 percent i know this because i've just written about it of women ages 18 to 34 have gotten unsolicited dick pics which is just like it just pops up in your phone oh a dick and we are (laughs) supposed to be we are supposed to be okay with that i really wonder what andrea dworkin would have said about all this i wish i so wish she were alive right now and i could talk to her about it or send her an email about it and say, what do you have? She would have written about it. She would have, she would have written about it and said something utterly brilliant. I think what she would have said is it's rape. It's like, a, it's a, it's a like kind of E rape, you know, getting a dick pic, someone waving their dick in your face. That's what, that's what fucking, uh, what's his name? Horrible man on the Supreme court, Brett Kavanaugh. Right. That's allegedly what he did to a woman at Yale was wave his dick in her face. Cool. She said, and and this is this is what you know this is it used to be called flashing but it's been so 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 normalized it is it's all... sexual harassment like if somebody did that to me i would feel sexually harassed yeah i mean have you ever gotten one no not from somebody like i think a long time ago one of my old boyfriends sent me one and i told him that i felt harassed because I didn't want, I was like, it was the middle of the day and it was like within a context of him pestering me for sex and me being like, I don't want to, I don't want to. So I was already feeling sort of harassed and then he sends me a dick pic and I was just like mad. I was like, what the fuck? Why, I don't, what, like, why, why are you sending this to me? I don't want this, but never from a stranger. Well, this is also porn influence too. You yeah. know, it is porn. It's self 
generated porn. It's what it is. And you can, you know, you can call it high art however you want. But what's that old expression? You can put a, a horse harness on a mule, but it's still a mule. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's porn and it's harassment and it's pressure that young women and girls feel and they're supposed to feel okay about it. And it's dangerous because once it's out there, it can get shared and non-consensually shared nudes have, are the source of, again, so much dysfunction, anxiety, depression, even suicide. That's so 2012. I told you what, what tipped me into the whole reporting on girls and social media and tech was all of these cases that were happening in 2012. There was a whole rash of them of non-consensually shared nudes that were leading to suicides. And these mm -hmm. things are still happening. Not as much. I've, I've noticed what's happening more is dating app rape. I have a Google alert on my phone for dating app rape, Tinder rape. Every, every week, every few days, I get one. It's so underreported in the media. I was for a while there for like a year. Every time I would get that alert, I would just post it on my Twitter and, and just hoping someone would do something mm -hmm. and, and say, look, look, can I not be the only one who sees this and is reporting about it? Can some? And finally, like I said, ProPublica did. And I think there was a uh, combination with ProPublica, BuzzFeed, and Columbia School of Journalism re reported on all these rapes. So, um, yeah, to, norm to normalize dating apps as just being, you know, like fun and, and, and uh, the new way to find love. For some people, yes, but we have to be realistic. And if we don't talk about the dysfunction on them, how are the companies ever going to be held accountable? Mm -hmm. You know, because they don't have to be legally. So writers, reporters have to talk about it, you know. And it's like you said, everyone is on them. And and when I took it to the head of Match Group, they own most of these things. You know, Match Group owns Tinder, okay, Cupid. They don't own Bumble. That's owned by oh, a Russian uh, oligarch-ish billionaire guy <laughs> who uh, huh. put up the money, and he's got all these sexual harassment problems oh, in his God. company. And uh, Whitney Wolf, who runs Bumble, likes to call it a feminist dating app, but meanwhile, that that makes absolutely no sense okay. whatsoever. There are rapes all over Bumble too, and they do nothing about it. Yeah. Um, but so. Um, yeah, this normalization of things like nudes, of things like dick pics, of of dating apps and not talking about the issues and the problems is, I think, since so much of it is abuse of women, we have to see that this is rape culture. Totally. So I know this is a, a, a difficult question to answer, but I... What would you what would you say to people, especially young people, men and women, what should they do today? You know, they're single, they want to date, they want to meet somebody, maybe they want a relationship, maybe they just want sex. And, you know, knowing all that you know about these dating apps and the impact on, on people's mental health and the, the horrible, you know, the negative way, let's say, the negative way that they're impacting sex, relationships, etc., I mean, what what advice would you give? Like, don't use them or? I think, you know, I am responding to it the way that I know how as a, as a woman. Uh, I've been through so many things as a woman, like all women do. Like, I'm just a woman who's, who's lived, you know, most of her life single. I would, like I said, I was married a couple times, but short for short spans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've, I've, I'm a single mom. I've been married twice. I've, and these are all, I'm going to put good and bad things in, in the same paragraph. So I don't mean to equate them. I'm just saying like, I've, I've been through all the things women have been through mm -hmm. pretty much. Um, I've been raped. I've been sexually assaulted. I've been sexually harassed in the workplace. <laughs> I mean, most women go through these things. And I've been through them. And then so when this stuff started to happen and this stuff started to come along and I saw it, I'm doing what I know how to do mm -hmm. to bring awareness to it. I wrote a book. American Girls is about girls and social media. But it's really a lot 
about what we've been talking about, nudes, dating apps, love, sex, and dating, how it's affecting, you know, uh, objectification, sexualization, all that stuff. I wrote that book. I made the film Swipe Token Up in the Digital Age. I've, I'm writing another book now. It's coming out next year, actually. And it has, it's about online dating and it's, it's, I'm writing another book about it. Um, I don't, you know, you got to know what's going on. You have to be able to understand what's going on. And also when things happen to you, it's important to know it's not just you. It's not just, it's not just you. I got this, uh, you know, DM the other day from a woman, she read my guardian piece and she's like, why do they want to push this down our throats that we're all supposed to be so successful and finding love on this dating up dating? Why do they keep telling us that? Because it's making us all feel like we are failures because we don't find these relationships, these perfect relationships on these online platforms, you know? So I guess I don't know what anyone should do all the time. You know, it's like, that's up to you. But I think it's really important to know that you're not the only one if you are experiencing these kind of feelings that aren't in line with what what they tell you is supposed to be happening. You know, that's what they always do to women, right? They always tell us like, oh, you're, you know, in the 50s, you were supposed to be so happy to just be a cute little housewife and like have a stove and, and mop the floor shiny. And that was supposed to, you know, have five kids and the white picket fence. And that was just supposed to make you so happy. Well, it made no one happy. It made women like want to take drugs, <laughs> you know, like mother's little helper, you know, like, you, oh, you know, you can't have a career because that's, you know, that's unladylike, all that stuff. So I think like I really bristle against any kind of line that they tell me I'm supposed to think or feel as a woman and what 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 worries me and concerns me is that these dating app companies have sort of co-opted the feminist line, like, like Mm -hmm. Whitney Wolf at at Bumble, you know, and even Tinder will say things like, Oh, this is the freedom that you want. (laughs) It's it's not freedom. It's like freedom to be, have your brain hijacked. Yeah. You know? So I just try and put out the information and, and the stories that I hear and I'll give a voice to people who have these experiences. Um, I'm not so comfortable telling people what to do. Like, you know, when I did the American girls book, I did a whole lot of talks at schools. Like, I don't know, more than 50 talks at schools in a, in a year and a half. And I went to, uh, I did a book tour and then a paperback tour. And like, you know, I, I, just people say, come talk to our kids. They're going crazy on the social media. You got to come tell them what to do. So I get up there in front of parents and typically like, you know, and they come at night and I get up on the stage when I talk to people all over the country, really red states, blue states. And I tell them all this stuff, a lot of stuff we've been talking about in this phone call, in this podcast. And then at the end, a lot of times, these are good people. They want to help their kids. You know, they see things happening. They want to help them. They say, what do we do? And I'm like, I just told you a lot of stuff that's not good is happening on your kid's phone. (laughs) So what could you do about the phone? Yeah. And they they, like stare at you like (laughs) the phone, like like, like, maybe don't give them one when they're eight. Yeah. Or maybe don't give them one when they're six or maybe not even when they're 12. You know, I feel for them though, because the schools are more and more like, putting stuff on screens and online. And, 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 and we see this all in this COVID thing, like, which translates to, well, that's good because now they can still have school at home. But guess what? Homeless kids can't. Mm-hmm. And poor kids who don't have Wi-Fi can't. So I think we should move. Personally, if I were queen, I, we, I think keep screens away from kids mm-hmm. because it's not good for them. You know, nobody thought COVID was going to happen. You know, you can't say like, well, that means it's good because we have a pandemic. You know, that's that's crazy. I don't think screens are good for kids and neither do doctors. And so I just socially and also for girls, especially they're they find themselves feeling pressure to be objectified and all this stuff. So but people 
want to be told. They want a PowerPoint. They want to say, well, first, you know, like first you should, you know, that's not the way my brain works. I, I don't, I don't like to tell people what to do. I have a more discursive sort of mm-hmm. approach to things. And I, I would rather tell you a story and like, have you draw your own conclusions mm-hmm. and, and, and sometimes data, if it's, tr- if it's trustworthy data is important to know. Like it's important to know that 50%, 57% of women have gotten graphic unsolicited images and, and harassing messages on dating apps. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's crazy. That mm-hmm. means that you're going to go on a dating app and mm, it's more likely than not someone's going to send you a dick pic or say something horrible to you in a dating space. Like that doesn't happen when you go on a bar. Someone doesn't come up to you and be like, oh, you're not as hot as you fucking think you are. You know, like that doesn't. Or like you know take I mean? out like, their dick. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. This, right. So, I mean, I just think that uh, I don't know. Like I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to not answer your question. I'm just trying to, um, I don't know when I saw all this happening with COVID, I'm like hoping I'm thinking like, maybe we can use the, maybe because this is so dire, it's so dire and it's so like, we're in a really serious kind of situation now. And we do, and maybe we can reclaim these things, these devices, and maybe we can use them now to actually try and use them as like the early days of the internet. There was this, you know, the philosophers in the early days of the internet saw it as um, this magical thing where we will all, it'll be utopian and we, we will all connect, you know, maybe we can use it that way and to be kind to each other and to help build society up. But then they, then I hear from all these young women that, that's not what's happening on dating. I'm not on any dating apps right now or anymore, but I hear that things are still the same quarantine and chill. Like some of these things, did you read that piece? Like I got Mm -hmm. so many, Oh my God. I got so many things from women that were just like horrible. I'll bring lube and masks. Yeah. You know, Yeah, like, I'm here with my girlfriend, you know, stuck in quarantine. I don't know how long this is going to last. Distract me. Gross. Yeah. And so I'm thinking, Jesus, I don't know. I think uh, really what has to change is that there has to be a systemic change. Radical feminism has to change society. The the answer is radical feminism. Here's my PowerPoint. Number one, radical feminism. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, like, it's not... I don't want to judge anybody. Do you do what you got to do to get you through the night, as they say? But I don't think that dating apps serve radical feminism at all. So um, I don't think they serve people. I don't think it serves humanity. I think it hurts humanity. So exactly right. They don't. They don't hurt. They don't help men either. No. Men don't feel good on these things. I will tell you this. I had, okay, so I did this, um, I did this story in 2015 that Tinder got really mad about and they tweeted at me 35 times in one night or something. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know about that? No. It was so weird. It was this story called Tinder. I do not write the headlines. Okay. I mm-hmm. just, I reported this story. It was 2015. Uh, it was another way of like 2013, 2014. The media was like, tender. So great. Oh my God. The, I believe Sean Rad was on the cover of Forbes magazine. Mm. And it was like the wonder boys of tender. They're making dating great again. And you know, all this kind of stuff. And I, so I was like, that's not true. And I, so I wrote this story and it was just about, Everything we've been talking about, right? But it was 2015, so early days. They got so mad because they were used to having the red carpet rolled out for them by the media. It was a big thing, and I just <laughs> they I got they got very mad. They tweeted at me 30 times in one night. I was out to dinner with some friends, and one friend was friend of a friend was on the phone. She's like, "You're trending on Twitter," and I was like, "What? Why?" And she said, oh, Tinder is like tweeting about you. <laughs> they kept adding me with a- adding me with these tweets that, like, you're not a good journalist. Like kind of like that guy that I told you, like it felt very similar. 
it's that guy who's like, I can't believe I have to tell you how to be a journalist. I'm like, interview people. And why didn't you call us? I didn't call you Tinder because I didn't have to because it was about how people use your app. I know if you called you, you would just say, we're great. And yeah, you would get like a press release kind of statement. Yeah, and all those stories have already been written. I don't like to do what everybody else did. I want to yeah. talk to real people and see well, what, what they What does say. Twitter, Twitter think about, or sorry, Tinder think about this? It's like, I they were so mad. They were so mad. <laughs> they were so mad. We have, we have, we're in 120 something countries, which is true. I think it's like 190 countries now, including North Korea. Well, that wasn't true. Because they don't even have, like, internet there. But, and so all these people were, like, a lot of people were actually on my side because they were just, like, showing their ass. And a lot of people were, like, doing funny memes. Like, they did Kim Jong-un trying to swipe on a on a rotary phone. <laughs> like, how do I swipe on this thing? So I was like, oh, God, this is all so weird. What are they so mad about? And these, these, these tweets just kept like coming and coming and coming and it was it was actually a little scary at a certain point it felt like harassment i was harassed i was harassed by a corporate twitter account and i don't think that there are many cases similar to that Mm -hmm. and um nobody came to my defense um it was written about widely in the media this whole meltdown and when it was written about um, it was written about from this perspective, which was like, was that a bad idea for Twitter, for Tinder <laughs> to do that? Like, was that bad for their, their corporate brand? Nobody said like, hey, did this company just like harass and degrade a journalist? Like, nobody said that. I think maybe one guy at a, at a small outlet raised that point. But mostly people were just like, like the New York Times wrote about it and and all these people, and they're just like, gee, Tinder, that might not have been good for your brand. Not like, what about me? Mm-hmm. Like, I am a person. I am a, like a, a woman reporter doing my job. And so anyway, why was I talking about this? Oh, yeah. So I've talked to these Wall Street guys, right? Um, young Wall Street guys, real handsome. And they like think they're really cool and everything. And they were like, yeah, I fuck like a different girl every night. Yeah. Of course. You know, and yeah, and and everything. So one of them um, be, sort of became my friend. Like they, I don't know. Like I, I interview a lot of young people, and like you know, they they kind of. It used to be back in the day. It was like they saw me as like the big sister they could talk to. Now it's like I'm like the mom they could talk to. So he, after some time, he reaches out to me. And he said he was, he was doing, he was addicted. He was doing a lot of tindering. He was doing a different girl every night. Mm-hmm. And it was just all this fun thing. That was what you're supposed to be doing. See, this is why I'm, I'm taking your point that it's not good for humanity. It's not toxic masculinity as we know is bad for men. It's even bad for their physical health. It's bad for their mental health. It's bad for their physical health. This doesn't, it's not good for anybody. You know, it's hurting them. So he, he, he texted me. I remember I was in the car going to, I had to give a talk somewhere. He texted me. He says, what do you do if you feel like you're going to commit suicide? (laughs) And I said, you go to the emergency room right now. And, and he was like, I just feel really weird. Like I, I just, I feel really weird. So he, he got help and he um, had a number of addiction issues. See, this is the thing. It's not just one addiction mm. a lot of times. It's addiction to dating apps and other social media. And it can, it's a cycle of addiction. It can be, in America, we're addicted to everything. Drugs, uh, consumerism, shopping, food, you know. Was, uh, he was addicted to things. I won't say what because I'm, you know, I don't know if anybody knows him. He was addicted to stuff. He was feeling, he was crashing and feeling really awful. And he got help, and now he's better. And um, this sounds like a, this might be a good thing to end on. It sounds like a cheesy, corny story that I made up, but it's absolutely true. I swear to you. He went to a shrink, and the shrink said that he should get a hobby. (laughs) (laughs) Rather than tendering. So he started swing dancing. (laughs) <laughs> he became yes 
And he became like really into the swing dance community. And now he's a big swing dancer and he's got a girlfriend that he met swing dancing. So I'm not saying everybody should go out and swing dance, you know, although I do love the way it looks and it's fun to watch, you know, um, YouTube videos of like old timey swing dancing are really fun to watch. Mm -hmm. You know, like the, what do you call it? What's it called when they do all the flips and everything? It's really cool. Yeah, yeah. What's that called? I don't know. <laughs> well, the no. Charleston is from the 20s. But, you know, like when they would go to, like, you know, ballrooms. And, like, wait, well, he does all that. And he met a woman. And now they swing dance together. And obviously everybody can't go and swing dance. But, you know, you don't have to do this. Like, you don't have to tender. You're doing it because... Your brain's being reprogrammed to think that you have to. And because the New York Times and other um, media outlets, for reasons I just don't understand, are telling you that this is the thing you should be doing. But you don't have to. You know, there are other ways to meet people. And and you still do meet people. I mean, I meet people all the time. Like, I mean, not now because I'm not going out. But you know what I mean? Like, it's still, people act like it's, it's hard to meet people and... It's not that hard. I mean, sure, it's hard to find, like, your soulmate sometimes, but, it, it, you know, you just go out and you talk to the person sitting next to you at the bar. <laughs> like, Yeah, or or whatever. You know, like I said, it doesn't have to be this big, heavy-duty thing where, you know, you have to find your soulmate, you have to find the love of your life. This is one thing that I think is so unfortunate, is that... Um, Young women, like in this day and age, in 2020, are still being made to feel like there's some kind of failure if, uh, you know, if they don't have this perfect relationship. Women are still judged on the quote unquote success Mm -hmm. of their relationship. It's called the Lindy. Oh, the the Lindy Lindy Hop. Hop. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have this like slow ram in my brain sometimes. The Lindy Hop. (laughs) So, um, yeah, he's doing all that stuff. So I'm just saying, like, it just. Come on, you, uh, you live your life. I mean, now we can't. I feel bad saying this because now, like, maybe you can't meet anyone because <laughs> you have to stay inside. Not forever. Like, we'll be allowed out forever. again. This really won't last forever. This is not 12 monkeys. This is no. not going to last forever. Modern medicine is amazing. They're going to find a vaccine. Look, I came of age in the AIDS problem. Yeah. You know, the AIDS epidemic epidemic yeah and it sucked because in the 70s you could do whatever you wanted and then suddenly it's like oh no it's scary you could die yeah it was very scary and everybody was like oh my god who did i sleep with and who did they sleep with and it was yeah. scary and it hit when i was in college and you know but so you use condoms you know and um there's a way to deal with this and we will find a vaccine now they're curing people with hiv even yeah. i mean it took 20 something years but it'll It'll happen. So one day you'll you'll all be out there dating again. <laughs> one day you'll be allowed out of your house again. <laughs> one day you can kiss somebody. Oh, uh, I'm so I miss <laughs> hugging and kissing people so much. Everything else is sort of okay for me. Like I let I work at home, right? But I'm just like the I know deprived of I, like cuddling with somebody is is hard. I know the cuddling. I love kissing. I I'm just a I'm like really really into kissing. I yeah, love it. That's one thing I, I didn't like too. about hookup culture when I experienced it was it's not so much into the kissing sometimes. Yeah. Kissing but... is like the sexy part. It's like where you get all like amped up and feel like passionate and you, your brain turns into mush. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And, you know, also, well, this is for another discussion. It's for a way other discussion. It's, <laughs> it's a very complicated thing, but now everyone's so afraid to kiss somebody because they're afraid like somebody will say they're sexually harassing them or something, which sometimes yeah. they are, yeah. which is, you know, it's just, it's really, really complicated. Yeah. Like I had kisses in my life that were sex- straight up sexual harassment. And if they happened today, I would have the guts with the Me Too movement to like call someone out. Yeah. But then I had kisses where it was like, oh, like, yeah, like I had people kiss didn't me. Didn't see that coming, but so totally. Glad I, did. <laughs> I like. I met a guy. This is. Uh, I'm not going to go on for too long, but I met a guy at work. Um, this was many years ago when I used to work in like an office, 
And we kind of became friends. And I guess there was like a little bit of a flirtation, but it kind of wasn't really on my radar. Like, I think it was he thought we were having some bigger flirtation. Like, I wasn't really clued into it <laughs> so much. And we went out for drinks after work, and then we were kind of sitting around talking, and he just all of a sudden kissed me, and I was like, what the fuck is happening? But then we also kind of fell in love. Yeah, see, these <laughs> like things do great. happen. They really do happen. And mm-hmm. and people have to um, allow them to happen sometimes. Mm-hmm. And read each other's signs and all that kind of stuff, which is hard to do, again, from across the screen. So hard. I mean, I just think, you know, look, if we lose love, it's like, I don't know. We've lost everything, really. What's the point of yeah. going on? And I'm just and relationships and intimacy with other people. I mean, that's what brings life meaning. You know what I mean? Friends Absolutely. included, your family, as well as partners and, and intimate partners, you know what I mean? I found my, I mean, you know, I would fail every Bechdel test if I stole the story of my life because I, <laughs> because, because I found myself, my feminism, myself, who I am through relationships with, with men. I mean, I did other things too. Like I, you know, I reported and wrote magazine stories and, and I, I became a mother eventually, but my, through my personal life and having relationships with men was how I learned how important feminism was Mm. because I realized like, wow, okay, that's not okay. I reject that. That's not something I'm going to uh, accept in my life anymore. You know, you learn about red flags that way too. Like you learn. And so now you just, you see through people so much more quickly because you've been through, you know, unfortunately been through bad dates or bad relationships with men where they end, they're abusive, verbally abusive, whatever. And so, you know, when you're younger, you don't see the red flags because you don't know that's a red flag. And so you learn sort of through that process, right? Exactly. Exactly. So, um, yeah. Um, thanks so much for talking with me. That was an awesome conversation. I really enjoyed it. It was. I'm <laughs> so glad we talked. And yeah. um, I'm glad we laughed a lot because... Yeah, everybody needs a little levity now. I hope that um, it's enjoyable for people and that they they get some you know they get some jokes out of it too because it's it really shouldn't it really shouldn't uh, it really shouldn't be something that is so heavy and sad and depressing this dating thing and I think a lot of young people are really 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 depressed about it and I, that that breaks my heart. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I I mean, I yeah, I th- I think more people need to be talking about this also. We're not having these conversations. I mean, you are, and I'm sort of trying to. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to spew. Yeah, of course. It was super interesting. So, and when is your your next article coming out? Do you know? Well, um I have I'm doing edits on this book that I have coming out in early 2021 on okay. online dating. It's in the editing stage. It actually had to be re-edited. We, it was pretty much done. And now this whole, this COVID dating started. So mm-hmm. I've been, that's why I've been talking to so many pe- people about it and reporting on it because it wouldn't, I mean, it, it wouldn't be relevant. It, w- it would absolutely like, you couldn't put out a book on dating without including this movement and this, what's happening right now. Yeah. So that's why I've been talking to, women and now I'm trying to talk to some guys about it too and see what they're they have to say about it so I can include it and uh yeah so it's coming out early 2021 it's called um should I tell you what it's called Hmm. could somebody beat me to it can I tell you but you not put it on the thing well don't tell me just uh no I really like the title I'm not good at titles and I I usually don't write them but I I like this i read this. oh well that's what i was going to tell you so the title of that article was tinder and the dawn of the dating apocalypse right right, right. i don't write the headlines but t- it's called tinder and the dawn of the dating apocalypse I read that. Da- dating apocalypse was in quotes it's a quote so everybody who jumps on that piece and trashes that piece which is you read it now it's like it's completely right everything in it yeah. and everything <laughs> everything that and it's mostly quotes from people young people describing dating apps but how they use them but um, everybody says, 
oh, she said it's a dating apocalypse. People still date. What is she talking about? She said it's a dating apocalypse. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She's just old. Oh, she people never love was... to do that with headlines. Like, they just she's read never... the headline. They don't read the article, and then they judge you on it. And it's like, life. nobody reads their own headlines. <laughs> she was on a dating app in her life. Meanwhile, I'm, like, you know, asking for ID from, like, NYU students that I meet on Tinder. Anyway, <laughs> so they're like, she doesn't know. She's old. No, somebody actually said I was too old to understand dating apps. Mm, like, the, the ageism is so acceptable now. It's really, it's like the one thing that's like, oh, you know, old ladies might as well just, like, go slit their own throats or something. It's just, yeah. like, it's so, so weird. So it's called Tinder and the Dawn of the Dating Apocalypse. But I didn't write the headline. And Dating Apocalypse was a quote from a young woman who is so funny. And she also had this quote. She called it Pussy Affluenza. Dating FOMO. It's like pussy affluence. Like the young men just like they have too many choices. And this mm. pussy affluence is like ruining them all. Mm. So anyway, but I did make the headline to this book and I like it a lot. And it's about, it's about, um, yeah, it's just about how, how dating apps have really uh, upended not just dating, but a lot of other things in society too. Marriage, family, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's really uh, a significant force. Dating is not a trivial subject at mm-hmm. all. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate all this. Thank you so much. And I'm going to go find out what happens to uh, Carrie on Homeland. This is oh, a series okay. finale. Okay. I really hope she doesn't kill Saul. I'm I, just, I, do I, you haven't, know that... I haven't watched. Should I watch that show? Am I missing out? It makes me crazy because she's this brilliant CIA agent. Well, of course, she's bipolar and fucked up, right? Okay. Because it's so it's kind of sexist. But I love Claire Danes. I love her so much. And I love Mandy Patinkin, who was super hot back in the day. He's like, he's, have you ever seen Yentl? No. (laughs) Don't. Okay. He's he's also in Princess Bride. He's not the prince, but he's one of the other pirate guys. Yeah. He was so hot back in the day. So now he's like, he's like this old grandpa looking guy. And it's about this relationship between these two. It's really about these two CIA agents. And now it's the series finale is tonight, and she might have to kill him. And I really hope she doesn't. Okay, well, I hope she doesn't for your sake. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Megan, if you if if they ever find a vaccine and we're not like housebound for the rest of our lives, if you ever come to New York, please let's get together. Oh, totally. I'll I'll be, yeah for sure. They'll find a vaccine. Um, I like this is my prediction. I don't fucking know anything, um, except for me reading about this constantly because I'm obsessed. But I think they'll find a vaccine probably like January, February. I don't know what's going to happen to travel before we get back to normal. But once we do get back to normal, I mean, I travel pretty regularly to do like speaking gigs and panels and stuff. So I'm positive I'll be back in New York again sometime in the future. And so we should definitely well, get together. I'd be so happy to take you out in the East Village. Yeah, I'd love to. Cool. Sounds good. Thank you so much. It was great to talk with you. You too. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.